So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce this um, last session after the, the two very productive conversations we've had so far. This time we have four academics, unless I'm completely losing the plot. We have two from English universities, one from Northern Irish University and one from an Irish uh, university. And they're going to talk in different ways uh, in a more perhaps analytical sense about what the Belfast agreement means in terms of Northern Ireland's past and future and its relationship to the external partners around the agreement, UK, Ireland, the European Union and the United States. So we want to think about some domestic political questions and try and put it also in, a, in, a, in some sense in a geopolitical um, context. As I said, we've got four speakers. I'm going to introduce them in the order that they are going to speak. First of all, we have Professor Deirdre Heenan, Heenan sorry, who's Professor of Social Policy at Ulster University. She's co-founder and former co-director of the Northern Ireland Line Life and Times Survey. She's been a policy advisor in the office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister and was appointed in 2012 to the Irish <coughs> President's Council of State. Then we have Mary Murphy. Mary Murphy holds a John Money Chair in European Integration and is a Senior Lecturer and Head of Department in the Government and Politics Department at University College um, Cork. She's a regular commentator on Ireland and Northern Ireland and the European Union in the media. And she worked between 2017 and 2020 on a three-year ESRC project titled Between Two Unions, the Const Constitutional Futures of the islands after Brexit. John Tone is Professor of Politics at the University of Liverpool. He spent a great deal of his academic career writing about Northern Irish politics, particularly the political parties in Northern Ireland. He's currently leading a big ESRC research project entitled Beyond Unionism and Nationalism in Northern Ireland. And he's also a regular television and radio commentator um, on Northern Ireland. And finally, from Cambridge, we have Professor Brendan Sims. He's a professor of the history of European international relations in the Department of Politics and International Studies. He's the director of the Centre for Geopolitics. And Brendan's written quite a lot of books, shall we say, on the, the geopolitical history of Europe. And I hope he's going to be situating the Good Friday Agreement in that context. So, I'm going to be quite strict um, with time. <laughs> so, Deirdre, you have seven minutes, exactly. Okay, thank you very much. Keeping the academics to the end is a good idea. <laughs> Keeping them to time will be a challenge, but I will absolutely do my best. So, I just want to start by saying, first of all, it's great to be here. And secondly, I learned many of my lessons from John Hume when I was Provost of McGee. Those of you who don't know, John Hume spent a huge amount of time in the McGee campus and he loved custard, just something I don't know if you knew, but when he came in, even at breakfast time, he liked custard. But when he talked to the students, he always talked about talking in three points. He said four was too many, two was not enough, and three was the ideal number, and people then knew where you were going, which I think is a good idea because even with the best will in the world, you start to drift off and think about other things and think about your dinner. Um, and you like to know where people are going. And I think particularly for academics, you do like to know that they have some sense of where they're going. So I want to talk about the Good Friday Agreement, reflections on that, but really talk about, and of course, academics like alliteration. That's another thing I can say about academics. So I want to talk about recognition, reconciliation and reform. And the difficult point about being on the last panel is a lot of this may have already been said. And so apologies um, at the outset if you think, oh, I think I've heard this before. So the first thing I would say is recognition. It's 25 years on from the Good Friday Agreement. And I think it is important that we recognize the achievement of the Good Friday Agreement. It's easy to forget. And we've talked about young people and how they take it for granted. I have three children in their 20s who knew nothing of the conflict. And when I talk about it, they roll their eyes in kind of boredom and go, God, she's off again. Um, and we don't want to hear about that terrible time you had, Mother, because frankly, we aren't interested. We are interested in getting jobs, 
getting on with our lives. And they're not interested in identity politics either. To a large extent, they're interested in their own lives, the opportunities that exist for them and their friends. And so, however, I think it is important to say that it was a huge diplomatic feat. It was the end of what we believed as we grew up in the Troubles to be an intractable conflict, that we would never come to the end of it. And the way we lived had been normalised. So I think particularly the Good Friday Agreement conference at Queen's, it was important to reflect on the achievement and the leadership and the fact that people were willing to take chances to move forward. And it is important to recognise that for many people there was great personal sacrifice in the chances that they took, that it would have been easier to walk away but there was also a great hand-holding from the American administration, the Irish administration, and the British administration. So almost all the pieces appear to fall into place. And the big prize for us has been peace, uh, but there is still work to be done. And I think that is the important point in saying there is recognition. And it would have been very hard not to have been at that big celebration of 25 years where we had the Clintons, we had Blair, and we had the architects of that process. And we thought about the architects who weren't there without thinking about that outside of that room, there were people looking on in despair, people experiencing the cost of living crisis, people saying, are these people for real? We have no government. We are drifting along here rudderless and there they are at dinner after dinner. Don't they understand what it's really like? What the reality is like on the ground? So there was that juxtaposition and, and on a personal level, I think we've had the 25 years celebration. I, I'd be happy if we didn't have another one until 50 years, maybe 100 years, and then we'd be well out of it, hopefully by then. Um, the second point is reconciliation. Again, I think there was a prevailing sense that after the Good Friday Agreement, there would be much work on reconciliation. And we would really concentrate on bringing our communities together, addressing the hurt and healing the hurt. Unfortunately, I think that hasn't happened in any meaningful way. And I was very interested in our first panel who talked about the grassroots experience and the fact how disappointing it is that after the FLA and the the momentum that brought the flood to Derry, that it, there is a feeling that we've actually gone backwards, that there is retrenchment, that we have retreated from where we thought we were because people are afraid that they feel there isn't the generosity of spirit that perhaps there was at that time. But reconciliation to me is one of the pieces that we have got to address if we're really going to move forward. Um, and reconciliation in a meaningful way. Um, I don't think it was unrealistic to think that uh, the segregation would begin to start to be removed, and really it hasn't. Very little has changed. Um, I don't subscribe to the view that integrated education is the panacea, and if only we'd integrated in education, then we would all learn to love each other. You know, you can't integrate schools and send people back to communities that are segregated and expect that that's going to be the answer. And as was said at the outset, um, I, for my sins, was one of the founding members of the Northern Ireland Life and Times, and it always struck me that when you went out and surveyed people, the joys of surveying, 75% would say, I would send my child to an integrated school. But when it came to the crunch, parents sent their children to what they perceived to be the best school for them. If it were an integrated school, then yes. But if it was the local Catholic school or the local Protestant grammar school, then that's where they went. And so I think we have to be a bit more realistic around those discussions about integrated education as a panacea, because I don't believe it is. And also in other parts of the UK, people have the right to send their children to faith schools if that's what they want to do. And I believe people in Northern Ireland should have the right to send their children to faith schools if that's what they want to do. So I think it's far too simplistic, the focus that we seem to have at the moment, particularly in the press, about um, integrated education. But Northern Ireland is still riven by sectarianism and we're caught in this chasm between peace and uh, reconciliation. We're talking about it. Um, I mean, it is extraordinary to me that in the press and in political programmes, we are still talking about people transitioning away from violence. 25 years later, are you serious? I mean, I think we've got to get serious about this. And I think there's a deep frustration with young people about that. Oh, I've been told to hurry up, so I better hurry up. 
Uh, reform is the big thing that I actually want to talk about. And the question is, is the consociational government past its sell-by date? 25 years on, the question is, is it still fit for purpose? Um, reform was built into the Good Friday Agreement, and I think it is important to say that, and it has fallen by the wayside. We really must reflect on whether or not the governance that we have is fit for purpose. And I would separate out the Good Friday Agreement, the principles of the Good Friday Agreement, which I believe are immutable. We are not going to move away from those principles of power sharing. We're not going to move away from mutual respect. I absolutely understand that people fear change. And in the context of Brexit, there is a fear that if you pull a thread, the whole thing would unravel. But what was really interesting to me was our political panel all agreed that change is necessary. How could they not, when you look at our public services and you look at the outcomes in terms of public services? My particular area of interest is health. Our health services is in chaos. Uh, last week, Rishi Sunak announced that there'd be 2.6 billion poured into workforce planning in the English NHS. We have been given 300 million pounds of cuts to put into our health service. Prior to the pandemic, we went and looked at a health trust in Liverpool, John, that had a similar size of population as Northern Ireland. And we looked at how many people were waiting for more than a year to see a consultant. The answer was 10. 10 people. And that trust knew who those people were and were actively working to get them to see a consultant. The comparable number in Northern Ireland for the same size of a population was 120,000 people. If that figure does not tell you that our health service is in crisis, then I don't know what does. And really, I think the separation has got to be, yes, the Good Friday Agreement, we should keep it and keep the principles, but we have got to address the chaos in the public sector because as Matthew Taylor from the National Federation said yesterday, of course it's on the news when someone's shot and injured in Northern Ireland and there is outrage. Every single day in Northern Ireland, people are dying on waiting lists, dying prematurely, dying in pain, dying with no one to turn to because they have no answers and the government is out and they don't understand why it's out. And I'll just finish saying, Connor and I have had many discussions about this. I agree that the context of austerity is very difficult. I agree that the budget's very difficult. But I would also say this, we get more per head of population than any other region in terms of health and social care. We have got to address in Northern Ireland how we spend our money and end our fixation with hospitals. We have got to move to prevention and early intervention in health and have healthy communities. Stop talking about life expectancy and talk about health expectancy. Because in Northern Ireland, we can currently expect to live 25 years of our lives in poor health. That is disgusting. So on reflection of the Good Friday Agreement, I say yes, the principles, we don't want to change them, but public services are outrageous. And I'll, I'll try to finish on a funny note. So we had one of our trusts over and um, you know, English people looking at our system and looking at the system in England, they said, we can't understand the apathy in Northern Ireland. If this was in England, there'd be people out in the streets. They'd be rioting. They'd be out with pitchforks. They just wouldn't stand for it. And one of the contributors, a little woman, said, listen, mate, we would 30 years of rioting. We're not going back to that. And, and so the answer appeared to be that if we're not killing each other, that's as good as it gets. I don't think that's satisfactory and I don't think anyone in, that, in this audience would agree that that's where we need to be. Thank you. Mary. Thank you. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone, and, um, and thanks to the organisers for the invite. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as academics, one of the things we do, which, which we're doing right now, I suppose, is we research and we share our research. But one of the other things we do as academics is uh, we teach and we mark assignments. And uh, one of the things we're always sort of um, trained to do in marking assignments and in providing feedback is to provide, uh, to start off with a positive comment before you launch into all that's wrong. Um, and it's very easy to do that with the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement is, is a good thing and Northern Ireland is, is a better place for it albeit it was on the back of 
a, a high degree of compromise and, and sacrifice. But, but that's our starting point, and, and everyone today has, has revisited that point. But can I just maybe um, drill down a little bit more into that? Um, like Deirdre, um, I grew up during the Troubles, um, but I grew up uh, at the other end of the island of Ireland, so I'm, I'm from Watford. So the Troubles during the 70s and 80s, they, they really didn't touch my life in any substantial or significant away, way, aside from seeing all of the awful stories on the news. Um, but the Good Friday Agreement, I suppose when I reflect on it, it probably did change my life. And, uh, and I'm probably an extreme example of this. But my point is that uh, the peace process and the ceasefires and the Good Friday Agreement allowed me to move from the Republic of Ireland to Belfast to be a student at Queen's University Belfast at a time when my parents during the 1990s weren't too enthusiastic about the idea, to be honest. But I went there for a year and stayed, stayed for eight and enjoyed every minute of it and, and lived through that period in Northern Ireland when the agreement was being, um, uh, was being drafted and, and negotiated. Um, and thereafter, of course, uh, I, I went on to study the agreement and, and all its different dimensions as a student and, and now as a scholar, back down uh, at the other end of the island again, based in, based in Cork. Um, and as I say, I'm probably unusual um, in that I'm someone from the South who's had that experience. But I think it speaks to a very, very important aspect of the Good Friday Agreement, and that's its north-south dimension, and how it has made a contribution in terms of changing relationships on the island of Ireland, changing the extent to which there is contact across the border, um, et cetera, et cetera. But let me, let me put on my, um, my academic hat for a moment and, and, you know, again, sort of reiterate the point that's been made already today about the Good Friday Agreement certainly having achieved peace, but perhaps not having achieved reconciliation. So what we have in Northern Ireland um, is, is what's generally termed a period of negative peace. And a period of negative peace is the absence of violence, but it's the, the continuation of disagreement and tension. And, and it's disagreement and tension which contributes to the ongoing polarization of communities. So we have that. And to, and to be fair, in the, in the period after the signing of a peace document, that's to be expected. Um, it's, it's not unusual that the sort of those final phases of the peace process as you move from an effort at conflict management to resolution to transformation, um, that you have those difficulties that you, that you need to, to confront. It's not going to be smooth sailing. And it wasn't smooth sailing for a long time. What we don't have is what's termed positive peace, that integration of, of human society, where you have the presence of equity and, and equality and where you have a culture of peace and a culture of dialogue and, and a culture of cooperation. And I suppose the question to ask at this 25 year, uh, at this 25 year anniversary moment is why, why don't we have that? Why did the agreement not create and foster those conditions? And there's lots of reasons. Um, and we can disagree and, and agree about, about what those reasons are. I mean, there's so, those who would suggest that the power sharing formula maintains the divide. And in a way, we heard echoes of that in, in the earlier contributions. Um, there's suggestions that the party system, to a certain extent, entrenches the division because it facilitates the, the ongoing um, identification with community, although that is beginning to wane, as, as, as Kate alluded to earlier. We do continue to have segregation, um, as, as Deirdre has, has pointed to. And again, different perspectives on the merits or otherwise of, of education. Whether it's, uh, whether it's education segregation or housing segregation or peace walls or whatever the case may be. And we do as well still have echoes of paramilitarism within society in Northern Ireland. And bundled up in all of that is an absence of trust. So, so that has created an atmosphere whereby there is a lack of trust between the parties in Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland itself then does not trust different parts of the island of Ireland, whether it's the Irish government, the British government, the European Union, even, even the United States um, amongst, um, amongst unionists in particular. Now, it's not all the fault of the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement, it, it has its, its negativities and it has its challenges, but there are other exogenous factors 
So there's the role that has or has not been played sporadically by the Irish government, by the British government, by the European Union, by the US, that lack of, or sorry, that um, complacency, which, which we saw perhaps particularly um, from 2000, mid 2000s um, onwards. Um, and there is, of course, Brexit. And, and Brexit is the really, I mean, in my view, Brexit is the really important factor here. Brexit has been a disruptor. Brexit has, has created fractures. Brexit has created anger, and it's created anguish, and it's created fear, um, and it's disorientated people in ways which are, which are very damaging. So it's made people uncertain about the future. Where the Good Friday Agreement spelled that out to a certain extent, Brexit has, has undermined the moorings of, of that agreement. So what we've seen is there is destabilization of political relations, strand one. We've seen the institutions um, and the relationships underpinning North-South institutions being complicated, those institutions not meeting, similar to the Assembly. And on strand three, uh, we've seen a fracture in British-Irish relations, which has been particularly damaging as well. And then all of that has been fueled by, um, by the recalibration of the party system, which has, has been a sort of a, a cause and a casualty of this period. Um, the dire budgetary situation in the absence of, of, of institutions, laws unacted, et cetera, et cetera, everything that Deirdre has pointed to. So the question is, where do you go to from here? And, and reform is obviously an option. But I, I suppose the point I would make about reform is before reform, you need a credible commitment to the Good Friday Agreement. And we saw that earlier on the politics panel, the political party panel. But there was one party missing. And I suppose that, um, that's, that's, that's a very important observation. The appetite for reform has to be cross-party. And, and it, it's not cross-party. Um, and that's a problem. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative, the, the options are disputed. You know, for, for Sinn Féin, for constitutional nationalists, United Ireland might be an option. Um, for others, it might be a return to direct rule, et cetera, et cetera. So let me, let me conclude by saying that, that there is a, a degree of precariousness about the future be, because of all these various different um, conditions. And, and it's coupled with despondency, you know, and, and despair and disillusionment. And they are very, very troubling characteristics in a post-conflict society. So I finish by saying political leadership. That, that is the one and only true option. And it's local political leadership in Northern Ireland, some of which we saw on display here today. But it's also political leadership on the part of the British Irish governments. Um, and that political leadership might involve playing hardball. Thanks very much. John. Uh, thank you, Helen. Uh, big thanks as well to, uh, to Barry and uh, Neve and Iona for, for the invitation. Um, Unusually, for academic practice, possibly uniquely, I do actually intend to follow the brief here uh, and, uh, and address the questions that were sent to me. And the first question was, well, what aspects of the agreement have been successful uh, and unsuccessful? Well, we've already heard, we heard very eloquently from Claire Hanna before, you know, we need to move on. The absence of conflict is no longer enough. We should remember, though, that the hugely, hugely improved security situation really shouldn't be taken for granted. Just th those figures are, are always worth restating. 3,559 deaths in the 25 years prior to the Good Friday Agreement, 165 deaths due to the security, due to the security situation since, in the 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement. Always worth remembering at the forefront of any discussion. And it's worth looking back, in case we thought, well, there's that linear route to peace, people were war weary, etc. It's worth going back for this talk I went back and looked at the Northern Ireland referendum study of 1998 and looked at the data. And one of the, the few things that Unionist yes voters and Unionist no voters had in common uh, was that neither, neither of them, in neither of them was, was there a majority that believed there would be a lasting peace. Only 34% of Unionist yes voters believed there would be a lasting peace as a consequence of the Good Friday Agreement. So you know, there was a mood of pessimism there. And amongst nationalists and Republicans, only a bare majority, only 51% of nationalists and Republicans combined believed that the agreement would lead to a lasting peace. So never ever should we take it for granted. I think the other things in terms of what's been successful is the popular legitimacy of the Good Friday Agreement remains intact. Who here thinks that if there was a referendum on the Good Friday Agreement tomorrow that people would vote it down? It would be returned with a big majority. Okay? When the institutions function that were created in 1998, they function well. If you look at the volume of legislation passed, 
by the Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive from 2007 to 2016, the honeymoon period for, for the Bolgum in many ways. Uh, it was comparable uh, to the Scottish Parliament and better than what was achieved in Wales. The electorate has never given up on principles. Every single survey that's been done over the last 25 years says, A, we want devolved power sharing, uh, and B, when the institutions are down, people want them back. The most recent survey I saw showed that more than two thirds of people want them back. So there's a popular legitimacy still invested in the agreement that is worth defending. Okay. In terms of what's been unsuccessful, well, we can all catalogue, you know, and, and I'm sad enough to actually catalogue it on a daily basis. So I can tell you that from the 23 years since the 2nd of December 1999, when powers were actually devolved to the institutions, they've been down for 3,201 days of 8,612. We're about 37% of the time down. I think the more damning statistic is the fact that they've been down more in the last five years, 60% of the time, than in the first five years uh, in a society coming out of conflict when collapses were perhaps more excusable. Only two assembly terms have run their, uh, of seven have run their full course. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the Northern Ireland Assembly and what it could have been, it's become the poor relation of the devolved institutions. And that's tragic in many ways. The Scottish Parliament has soared ahead in terms of its powers. Uh, you've moved from a fairly Mickey Mouse, has to be said, Welsh County Council model to a full-blown Parliament, Senate Cymru in Wales, and yet, you know, Northern Ireland Assembly uh, remains in the starting stalls. Uh, I thought points very well made by, by Connor Murphy earlier about you know, some terrible budgets which have not helped uh, as, as well. And only 7% of the population believe the executive functions well as a, as a government. Good luck to that 7%. Uh, I've got a lot of admiration for them. How much, how much should we beat ourselves up over this? Well, you know, if you look at consociational political systems around the world, name me one that's stable. Um, you know, Belgium, no government for 592 days and a dispute with Northern Ireland as to who should hold the, the Guinness, you know, the, the record in terms of the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest non-government. Bosnia deadlocked for years, secessionist threats from the Serbs, Iraq uh, unable to form a government. The, the common theme is <laughs> wherever Doug served, there's problems. If, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the point is the consociational problems uh, are not unique to Northern Ireland. So, again, we should not get uh, too downbeat about it. It raises questions about whether it's an appropriate uh, form of conflict management. The four other questions that I was sent were, A, is the agree agreement still fit for purpose? B, is reform of the agreement necessary? B, uh, sorry, C, should dysfunctional parliamentary governance be fixed, and if so, how? And th then, can academics meaningfully contribute to public debate regarding the agreement and reforms? Well, obviously, I'm going to say yes uh, to the last one. I'd argue strand one needs obviously the most adjusting. Strand two was always modest and could have been a lot more than it was. And strand three has too often been moribund. You know, the fuss that was made when Rishi Sunak actually attended one uh, meeting of strand three, I thought spoke volumes uh, about it. And one other area to, that we need to cover is whether there should be much greater clarity on a border poll. And I'll come back to that if I, if I get time. So the agenda for reform, I don't want this to read like some sort of, you know, uh, part of the 92-page Alliance Party manifesto that was produced at the Northern Ireland Assembly election because some of these proposals do uh, have uh, a similarity. I thought that First and Deputy First Minister should have been retitled long ago and that ship has probably sailed. They are co-First Ministers uh, when all's uh, said and done. Um, I'd even question whether you need a Deputy First Minister in, in some ways. I should think about I think one of the areas, there's obvious dangers in cutting out the largest party of unionism. If you simply say, and I perfectly understand why Naomi Long at a party conference only a few weeks ago said this. Was, she said, she asked her conference quite reasonably, who here thinks that if parties knew that government would carry on without them, would they walk out? Right? And it's a good question to ask. But you can see the dangers if you eliminate the largest party of unionism from the equation, then there are dangers. So, what I suggest is a compromise of time-limiting party vetoes. You know, if a, I know it's not a good week for talking about the laws of cricket, but um, uh, you know, if a batter doesn't get to the crease in time, they're eventually timed out. Well, you know, should it be timed out where you're allowed a veto for so long and then a government will be formed regardless? So you can have a cooling-off period. Uh, I think that's something to, to seriously consider. 
I would abandon the communal designations. You should designate as a human being. People know what Sinn Féin stands for. They want a united Ireland. People know what the DUP stands for. They don't want a united Ireland. And the clues in the title, Unist, Democratic Unionist Party, same with the Ulster Unionist Party. Do you need communal designations? We should go to a system of weighted majority voting uh, for consensus within the Assembly. I agree uh, with what was said earlier. I don't think petitions of concern are the main problem anymore, uh, given where party strengths uh, are at. Uh, I welcome the fact that we will, when Stormont, and I'll say when rather than if, let's be optimistic, I, I, I welcome the fact there will be a system of uh, government and opposition. The SDLP might have been forced into that in reduced circumstances, but I think it's a good thing. Uh, and another thing that I think should have been considered is Chris Eaton Harris says that he can't just penalise those MLAs who walk out. At my own institution, there's been a teaching and marking boycott for various, as, as across the university sector. Okay? People have been deducted salaries if they're not engaged in marking a, exam scripts. Why should uh, all MLAs continue to get paid, including the party that has walked out of the institution? I don't understand the logic of that, surely. And I'm not saying that that will necessarily, you know, the DUP has made very clear that you know, they would eat dust rather than go back in in the current circumstances. But there's a, there's a logical argument to say, if, you don't, if you're not prepared to uh, nominate a speaker then, and, not, and put the assembly back together, then you shouldn't be paid. Final area, realize conscious of the time, is uh, one area of the Good Friday Agreement which will become more and more, it's not going to go away, clarity in terms of uh, the criteria for a border poll. I was on the panel with uh, the Sinn Féin meeting with Peter Kyle, the Shadow Secretary of State, and he may not, not be shadow for that much longer, where he said he would publish the criteria uh, as to uh, when a border poll should be called. Uh, and I welcome that. I think that there should be, I think it's fair to both Republicans and loyalists that there are clear and uh, transparent criteria. We can debate what they should be as to the circumstances in which uh, a Secretary of State would call a border poll. I think it's too important to shirk that uh, any longer. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, John. Brendan. Thank you very much. It's been a very interesting um, day so far. I'm very grateful to uh, Neve, Barry and Iona uh, for the invitation and to the Future of Ireland uh, programme here in Cambridge. I was given, like uh, Jonathan, 10 questions uh, to answer, but I'm going to just concentrate on two of them. Um, one is, can academics meaningfully, meaningfully contribute to public debate on the agreement? Uh, and secondly, what is the responsibility of the larger partners, UK, Republic of Ireland, US, and the EU? So to take the first question about the academics, um, I think, and you've already heard it uh, around the table, uh, we can offer depth uh, and wider framing. And the wider framing I propose to offer, very briefly, is geopolitical. I direct uh, a centre uh, for geopolitics here uh, at Cambridge. And I think that the, the really key point is to understand the relationship between Ireland, England, stroke UK, and Europe as a triangular one, historically, and in the present day. Um, from England, stroke UK's point of view, um, Ireland historically was a backdoor, um, a backdoor for Philip II of Spain, for uh, you know, um, the France of Louis XIV, uh, for Napoleon, revolutionary France, for the Kaiser, for Hitler, for the Soviet Union, uh, to uh, attack or to challenge uh, England stroke UK uh, in, in Europe. And so closing that back door in one form or another was a major uh, strategic interest uh, for England stroke UK. Now the Good Friday Agreement, moving forward very swiftly, uh, um, landed in a geopolitical sweet spot, which is the end of the Cold War, um, a time when it was possible for UK government to say in the 1990s that it had no selfish strategic interest in Northern Ireland, uh, which uh, was certainly not true historically. Um, I doubt was true then. Uh, it's certainly not true now. Um, but at that time, uh, that, was, um, uh, that was the policy. And so what happened uh, uh, in, in Northern Ireland and in Ireland uh, more broadly was in that wider uh, sweet spot. And the connection between uh, the geopolitical and, and Northern Ireland, I think came back again during the whole Brexit and backstop negotiations, which certainly in its early stages, whatever you think of Brexit and whatever you think of the uh, <clears throat> May deal and the, the protocol, um, it was lopsided 
against the interests of unionism. That was certainly their perception. And the reason why uh, it went through, also lopsided against uh, uh, an interpretation of UK interests, was the weakness of the UK within Europe. It was clearly perceived as the weaker partner between 2016 and 2019. In turn, however, um, the shifting geopolitical situation has changed the story around Ireland and, and, and Northern Ireland. Um, the Ukraine war um, has reminded the rest of Europe of the Russian threat. So, for instance, if uh, Russian aircraft penetrate um, airspace of the Republic of Ireland or come down from the north, it's the RAF which is uh, scrambled uh, to, to, to deal with them. And indeed, Doug said, Doug Beatty said that um, to a certain extent, the, the more recent uh, Windsor protocol, uh, Windsor uh, framework, reflected that new understanding of, of the geopolitical uh, in Europe. Um, so that's, that's an important, I think, geopolitical uh, framing. And I think what's interesting about this is the way in which the external guarantors um, for the agreement um, are it's actually dynamic. So in 1998, uh, I don't think anybody would particularly have said that the European Union was a central uh, factor in the agreement. Um, it wasn't particularly a large factor during the Troubles. Both um, countries, I mean, UK and Republic of Ireland, joined what was then the EEC um, uh, at the same time, uh, roughly at the moment when things were getting very, very bad in, in Northern Ireland. And in fact, the Republic of Ireland essentially got in on the coattails uh, of the UK. I mean, the UK was basically at that point the gatekeeper, as it had been historically. Uh, for, uh, for Ireland. So, and then um, uh, the EU um, played an important role, I think, in rolling out the agreement. Um, and so a big question, I think, will be what will the role of the European Union be in future in Northern Ireland? It is now a guarantor, de facto. Uh, it is a guarantor of the Northern Ireland uh, arrangement. Secondly, uh, the responsibility uh, of uh, the major actors for the agreement. Very briefly, I think the first thing is that the, the major outside actors need to be honest about their priorities. Um, in the case of UK leavers, um, it's quite clear that they uh, prioritised Brexit over the integrity of the United Kingdom. They abandoned uh, effectively uh, the Unionists and in that sense uh, damaged the Good Friday uh, Agreement, or at least many of them did. The same is true, actually, of, of Remainers in this country. Uh, they had several opportunities to vote for what was said to be uh, the guarantee uh, of Northern Ireland, which was the May deal. They, Liberal Democrats, Labour, uh, and Remainer, uh, hardline Remainer uh, Conservatives, they decided not to do so. Um, as far as the European Union and the Republic of Ireland is concerned, I think it should be honest that its priority is the defence, the pr primary priority is the defence of the single market and that if erecting a customs border uh, between the six counties and 26 counties damages the Good Friday Agreement, then logically uh, uh, erecting one in the Irish Sea does also, even allowing for the difference between a sea border and a land border in terms of the sovereignty issues and identity issues. Uh, they're exactly parallel. Secondly, I think the outside actors uh, uh, should not use the agreement uh, to pursue other aims. So during the Brexit negotiations, it was clear Unfortunately, that the European Union did use uh, the issue uh, to, to, to punish inverted commas, that there would be a price. This was a phrase that was often used, I heard it myself, on the margins of meetings, uh, to punish the UK uh, for Brexit. Um, and then lastly, um, I think uh, one should try to avoid weaponizing other issues, supposedly in support of the Good Friday Agreement. So as an academic, for example, uh, the suspension of the uh, Horizon program uh, uh, was an important factor, uh, bringing in external or extraneous um, elements. And I want to end, I have one minute left, uh, with a plea for creativity, because I think one of the things that's come across very clearly um, in what we've heard so far uh, from the other panelists, and of course is, is a hallmark of the agreement, was the way in which it was able to, you know, fudge and, 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 and um, share sovereignty. What would seem to be the impossible was, at least for many people, achieved in the agreement. Um, and it seems to me that the early years of the uh, Brexit negotiations, particularly the ones over Northern Ireland, showed a remarkable lack of creativity. 
there was simply one rule. There was uh, a single market. And before that, uh, everybody uh, had to bow down. And so any kind of creative thinking was dismissed as magical thinking. But what was the Good Friday Agreement, I would suggest, but magical thinking? People who really tried to think creatively about a way forward. And so my concluding thought is that actually the Windsor framework, though it has many uh, problems uh, from the union's point of view, did show some of that flexibility and creativity, which for a long time we were told uh, was not possible. Um, and I would suggest that we will need much more of that creativity and flexibility in the times ahead if the Good Friday institutions are to be made operational again. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. I'm going to ask a, I hope, quite big question that you can all come at in, <laughs> in different ways. So if we think back, like, 25 years ago, even the late 90s, um, there was a great deal of optimism in the world. There was optimism in many ways that we didn't live in a geopolitical world any longer. If we go back to the kind of things that Brendan's been talking about, in part that was to do with the weakness of Russia, to do with the fact that people at least appeared to be optimistic about integrating China into the world economy without that being disruptive. It was an age of optimism about the ability to solve some long-standing violent conflicts, not just obviously in Northern Ireland, but in other parts of the world too. There was even optimism for a while about the Arab-Israeli peace um, process. And at least from the Blair government, there was optimism about reforming the United Kingdom constitutionally that engaged in a great deal of constitutional reform in that first term in um, office. And on all scores, I think we would agree without any difficulty, that we live in a rather different world now. Um, certainly, it, the places where there isn't peace, there's less optimism that it can be brought about. The, ge the world is clearly geopolitical, and it's much more dangerous um, than it was. Economic conditions are much harder than they were, and we've been living since at least 2008 crash with a set of democratic disruptions across um, Western um, countries. And I think that we can all see that Blair's government's reforms of the United Kingdom's constitution turned out to be a lot more complicated and a lot more fraught than the people in New Labour thought at the time, not least in relation to various devolution questions. So in different ways, I wonder if you could each say something, in, starting with you, so in the order that we started, <coughs> of like how much you think that there is something unique to Northern Ireland in terms of where we are now compared to where we, the optimism of 1998, and how far you might put what's happened in Northern Ireland into this bigger picture. And I don't really mean by bringing Brexit into as one of those obviously disruptions, but I mean, is it part of a much bigger story? Obviously it need be all those parts of it, but is any part of it do you think is it true? I think it is part of a, a, a much bigger story. Of course, we've had the economic crash. We've had Trump. We've had COVID. All of those things have been huge shocks to what we consider to be normal. But I actually think earlier we talked about the community now talked about anti-British feeling in Northern Ireland. I think what really has changed in the last 13 years of Conservative administration is that it's become clear that there is no longer an emotional attachment to Northern Ireland, that we are not a priority. And that has changed. And so there is an Anglo-centric nature within the UK, which has really changed how Northern Ireland is viewed. Remember Dominic Cummings said he, he wanted us to fall into the Irish Sea, was it to, to be rid of us, um, that we are deemed to be a problem. And actually, we need to get a hold of ourselves because, you know, we are just fixated with ourselves. It is time for us to move on. But that Anglo-centric nature has been very important as a change of how we are viewed within the UK and how we're viewed within the EU and or the, the EU and of course when Trump was in power, how we were viewed within American politics. Um, but for me, what is really important is that idea of um, basically 85% of the population of the UK are English. We are just basically a pain in the backside. And I think there is a feeling that we have got to move on and solve our own problems. What I think is different though with that Anglo-centric nature is again, we have found ourselves in this position of indirect, direct rule. 
and no one has discussed it. We haven't had a big symposium to say, how did we get here? Uh, what does this mean for us? Why have we accepted it unquestionably? And that was back to the last time we were in the period of indirect direct where it was because of the confidence and supply agreement and it was too difficult to make a change. But, you know, we've had more conversation about Michelle O'Neill going to the Queen's funeral. We've had more conversation about Arlene Foster going to a GAA match than we've actually had about this form of governance that we find ourselves in that we apparently accept without question. And I don't believe it be accepted anywhere else. And we haven't had a debate to say, what's the alternative? And is it acceptable for Chris Heaton Harrison? Uh, I agree with John, he's quite a mystery. To say on the one hand that, of course, I couldn't do anything because if I made a decision, it would look like direct rule, and direct rule was a disaster. Well, mm, yes, but I can give it up, a punishing budget. I can get involved in abortion issues. I can get involved in education issues because they're clearly devolved issues. So for me, basically what has happened is Northern Ireland is of much less interest on the global stage. There is a belief that we're a problem that has been solved. It's time for us to move on because there are much bigger problems in the world and we need to really understand that we are very small in the grand scheme of things. Uh, during the Trump years, there was much less interest in us. But for me, the big issue is the last 13 years of Conservative government have been very much Anglo-centric and are rolling back. David Frost talked about a rolling back of devolution. Yet we have the DUP saying we're in this position because we want to be the same as every other region of the UK. The whole point about devolution is we were never the same. We will never be the same. The point of devolution is to play to the strengths of the regions. And for unionists, the point about it is the UK is made up of different parts. That is its strength. And if you want to maintain the union, you play to your strength and make sure that you're playing your bit. But Northern Ireland's bit won't be the same as Wales, won't be the same as Scotland, won't be the same as England. So I don't know how this narrative of we all have to be the same and we have had a really raw day. We were always different. Um, but in your broader question, I, I kind of think that people have tired of this whole conflict this uh, and when you go to parliament particularly in Westminster there is a view of look you need to get on with it you know we've solved this problem this is now something that you need to deal with in house as it were I suppose what's interesting to me um, is also because we haven't had government there appears to be the the perceived wisdom in, in Northern Ireland was always we should be and don't want to make Northern Ireland work and whereas I think people now accept that whatever happens in the future it is best that Northern Ireland is seen to work, that we can address some of those endemic issues around our economy, around our health, around our education system. Mary. Hi. Well, um, if, if I just come at it maybe from a Republic of Ireland perspective and say, it, like, the, the Republic of Ireland of the 1990s is very different to the Republic of Ireland of today. In the 1990s, um, we went from a period of... Uh, underdevelopment to a period of Celtic Tiger, which lasted for a while, and then of course was, was burst by the, the financial crisis. But, but in all of that, I suppose, the Republic of Ireland emerged uh, not unscathed, uh, but certainly resilient in, in the face of that economic, um, that economic challenge. Um, Ireland is also an increasingly confident member of the European Union, um, and that was challenged by Brexit, of course. The loss of the UK was a very, very considerable loss at the, at the European table. And Ireland, I think, is grappling with, continues to grapple with how to, how to confront that, um, having, having lost the UK in, in that alliance position. Um, against the backdrop of the Good Friday Agreement, our relationship with Britain improved quite substantially during this period, not least in relation to the Queen's visit to, um, to Ireland, which, which, which everyone recounts. But, but the tenor and the tone um, of British-Irish relations became much more constructive. And again, Brexit represented a, a fracture of that. I think Irish society has changed very considerably over this period as well. Um, it's a much more liberalised society. Um, and, and, and again, we confronted issues around um, moral and, and, and um, socio-moral issues around abortion and, and, and marriage equality. Um, and even today, I think Ireland is, is, is confronting some of the bigger geopolitical challenges that, that Brendan speaks about in relation to our position on neutrality, for example, and what future for Irish security and defence. Um, as a member of the EU, 
um, and uh, in the context of, 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 the, um, of the crisis and the, and the war in Ukraine. Um, and then, of course, set against all of this is this growing narrative, um, emerging narrative around a united Ireland. And it's very much embryonic in form, and it's, it's quite unstructured, it has to be said. It, is, um, it, uh, it, it requires better framing if, if we're to have it in a constructive and, and sensible and, and confident way. Um, and, and that's not to suggest for a moment that the polls favour a united Ireland or that we're on, on the point of, 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 of getting to a united Ireland. Um, but nevertheless, Ireland, the Republic of Ireland has, I suppose, changed immensely in that period. And all of those issues that I've spoken to there, they touch on our relationship with Northern Ireland. And I suppose to some extent it, it exposes a degree of a gap or, or a disconnect between the two parts of the island, which again is tied up in some of those bigger, bigger discussions um, which have emerged from Brexit uh, around the future of Northern Ireland and what it means for the island of Ireland and for British-Irish relations more broadly. Okay, it's, it's a big question, Helen, and I'll try and put it in a broader framework. It's worth remembering, I'm going to take an optimistic note, it's worth remembering that the majority of peace processes still fail. 59% uh, have a return to violence at a level comparable to what preceded uh, the peace deal uh, within two years. So Northern Ireland or the North, whatever term you prefer, is a success story. Okay, it's a remarkable achievement. Uh, so that's the first thing to say. So I'm optimistic. It is true that that if you want to call it the golden era of liberal intervention in which you know, power sharing appeared to be the, the, the route through, whether it be Bosnia, whether it be uh, Northern Ireland, that era is over uh, of liberal interventionism. And I think there have been two jolts to it. If we, if we forget the sort of more domestic ones like Brexit, the two jolts were to it were, first of all, 9-11, uh, followed by uh, jihadist violence, which the, the, all the, all the, West, the West was determined to crush it. Uh, and the second one was... Um, a return to something like traditional geopolitics with, with, with Putin uh, in, in a conflict that may take years to resolve. So there's, you know, we've got to think about, about, about the wider body politic here. I think there was a feeling in the 1990s naively that you could simply get people to share power ultimately, freeze a conflict, put it in a consociational era and, you know, people wouldn't live happily ever after, but they manage their divisions happily ever after. I think people, you know, again, you know, quoting Claire, Again, people want to move beyond that absence of conflict. They want more. And I'm not sure that consociational, essentialist identity politics that's associated with deals like those in Bosnia or Northern Ireland can ever completely uh, do that. You know, you, you, you can't. But the, what's, what's, the, what's the alternative? Full integration? Well, people have those, cherish those identities, so it's very difficult. I think the other thing about peace deals as well is you never get symmetrical views of a peace deal. So if you take Bosnia, the, the Serbs, well, they want secession. They think they're hard done by. The Croats think they're hard done by because the Serbs got a you know, mini republic. So, and in, in Northern Ireland, look at the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey in 1998. Catholics overwhelmingly felt that there were equal benefits to both of the main communities without reducing uh, alliance to others, both the main communities in 1998. Protestants felt that nationalists had got more. Those two perceptions have not changed. And that's part of the problem as well, that, that uh, nationalists are broadly satisfied with the Good Friday Agreement, but there's always been substantial discontent within the Unionist community. It was a narrow majority, remember, in 1998. 57% to 43% on the Unionist side. It was a close call in terms of cross-community consent, and that hasn't dissipated. So there's an asymmetry of love for the Good Friday Agreement, which has been part of the problem uh, ever since. Brendan? Thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, any power sharing arrangement is always going to be uh, a second best. I mean, that's the whole reason why you have that arrangement. So the original one, I guess, is um, uh, the Treaty of Westphalia, which, which you know, brought to an end the Thirty Years' War. And uh, David Trimble, actually, I spoke to him about this, said, you know, it was the original um, uh, uh, Good Friday Agreement in that sense. Um, and so it ended uh, the conflict between... Catholics and Protestants in the military sense, but it, it then juridified it, and it reified it, and then it continued in many other ways, but it channeled it. And what we've been hearing is, is a similar uh, process in Bosnia uh, and in, in, to a certain extent in, in Northern Ireland, but it's also, of course, a lot better than, than had been there before. So 
Am I pessimistic or optimistic? Um, certainly, uh, um, you know, things could be better, but uh, I think that's still something worth celebrating. I just want to push back on two things that were said. One is about the growth of the United Ireland prospect. Um, and you were careful to say, of course, it's not reflected in the polls. And I think that's quite important to say. I mean, there was a lot of surprise in December uh, of last year when the Irish Times poll came out, which actually showed that uh, there was nowhere near uh, a consensus in all. In fact, there was a large majority who were settled uh, in favour of the union as opposed to a sm much smaller number uh, who favoured uh, 32 county. Uh, Republic, and then of course there are those who are undecided. Um, I think people were surprised by that because they assumed that because of all the pushing and shoving over Brexit, that a United Ireland seemed, or a 32 county Republic, seemed more uh, attractive. But of course, one result of what happened over Brexit and the protocol and Windsor framework and so on has been, I think, also to antagonize certain elements of, of, of unionist uh, opinion because t from their point of view, uh, Dublin and Brussels, as it were, has shown its hand uh, in a way that uh, perhaps they hadn't expected. And of course, you have the rise of Sinn Féin uh, in the 26 counties as well. The second thing I wanted to push back a bit on was the Anglo-centricity of politics on this side of the water, because um, obviously, you know, England is huge um, and it is the preponderance, uh, the English are the preponderance of the population. But the point is, and this was the original union concept, is that given that asymmetry, you would then be represented at Westminster on an equal basis. You know, in 1707, it was a slightly different franchise, obviously, than it is now, um, but that was the, the principle. And you know, had Brexit gone the other way with votes from Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, then uh, that would have been accepted um, by English leavers. Uh, they would have had to accept it. Um, and of course, when the original referendum was held in 1975, it, the picture was the exact opposite. I mean, England, I think, was the, uh, the, the, the area that was the most strongly in favor um, of, uh, of remaining at that point in, in the EC. So I think that's, it's just, uh, I'm reluctant to fall back on this idea of Anglo-centricity as something that explains uh, all of the problems, because that those are the rules. Um, and if you're in that political community, um, you have to live by them. Yeah, can I just respond to that? Yeah. Those are the rules, but I don't think there are any rules that say when Northern Ireland is in the position that it's in, that we find ourselves in this period of drift, that we should be allowed to drift. I do not believe that Scotland will be allowed to drift, that the types of things that we are asked to accept in terms of budget restrictions, in terms of what's happening to our public services, would be accepted anywhere else. And I believe that's because of a, a lack of emotional attachment to Northern Ireland, and that we did deliberately get a punishing budget, that we are being asked to live in this no man's land, uh, that there has been no robust discussion about direct rule, that Michelle O'Neill can go and visit Biden, uh, but we see Geoffrey Donaldson going over to Westminster to have discussions on his own. There's an 18 page document that we are not privy to, there was a panel report that we're not privy to, and there was very little discussion about, other than the DUP, about what, uh, apologise, others, and what nationalists want. They're entirely left out of the conversation. Um, and there is that uh, imbalance in conversation to say, well, what is best for the people who voted in Northern Ireland? What is it that they want? Um, and so I do believe that we are being treated particularly early at the moment and that in terms of devolution it is being cherry picked in a sense that if it's a difficult decision we're told well that's devolved and we can't do anything about it. We currently have civil servants running the country with absolutely no consistency, there is no transparency, there is no political accountability so permanent secretaries in different departments are making different decisions and we don't know what those decisions are based on and I'll give you an example in Educate our education uh, projects were taken away. Then they were reinstated because the permanent secretary said, well, they go against the grain of policy, which is about early intervention prevention. And then other policies were taken away 
and they also go against the grain of early intervention prevention. So there is absolutely no consistency as to what's going on. But permanent secretaries are told, on the one hand, you cannot make policy change, but on the other hand, you must live within your means. That is trying to square a circle that they cannot do. They are in an impossible position, and I do not believe that civil servants in England would ever be left in a similar position. And in fact, I don't believe they, would sim they simply wouldn't do it. I've got quite a lot of questions I would like to ask, but we've run out of time. Um, but you all get the chance to ask some more um, questions uh, in the next section. So it remains for me to thank our four speakers for their contributions and for answering my rather broad-ranging question. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all. And perhaps we can show our appreciation for the speakers.